three. The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 858 for Monday, February 22nd, 2021. Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where you send in your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found. We take them, we mash them all together into an agenda, and then we loosely follow that agenda because the goal is for each and every one of us to learn at least five new things every time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include Other World Computing at MacSales.com, Sunbasket at Sunbasket.com, where promo code MGG saves you 35 bucks, LadderLife.com slash MGG, and Lino.com slash MGG, where you get 100 bucks in credit just for opening an account. Pretty good stuff. We'll talk more in depth about each of those later. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How you doing today, Mr. John F. Braun? Yeah, keeping warm. That's yeah, that's good. That's good. I'm yeah. Our thoughts go out to all our friends in Texas and everywhere else that are suffering from all the uh, snow and cold. And I mean, yeah, no, it's snow laughing matter to me. That there's like it's been pretty serious. Yeah. So uh, hopefully, hopefully by the time this episode comes out. Uh, most of this is behind all of you and all of us, but yeah. Yeah. Let us know if there's anything we can do. You know how to find us feedback at Mac Yes. He said feedback at Mac It is feedback at Mac That's where you can send anything, but truly if you need anything from us, let us know. We are, you know, we are here to help in whatever ways we can, but that is also where you send in your questions, your tips, and your cool stuff found that we mentioned, you know, a couple of minutes ago. All right. Uh, in fact, Peter sent this in to that address. Peter, with a quick tip, our first of the day, he says, uh, let's say you want to drag a file into mail. I usually have mail as full screen, so dragging and dropping is a bit of a pain. Here's a nice hidden feature. Go to the finder and find your file to attach. Start dragging it. It doesn't have to go very far. Switch to mail via command tab and select your compose mail window. Continue dragging and the file will automatically pop up and now you can drop it. So, yeah, this is true. You can drag across uh, spaces this way and, and anything else that you can sort of navigate that way. So once it's in drag mode, uh, yeah, switch your context with the keyboard or whichever and boom, you can uh, you can drag it in. That's a great one. I I always I I don't spend a lot of time in full screen mode though. Now that I've adopted the new space, uh, all spaces have their own uh, all 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 screens have their own space. What's that setting, John? I can't even remember the name of it. Um, but now that I'm doing it the new way, which is not all that new, but uh, now that I'm doing it the new way instead of the old way, uh, it. Uh, I do wind up using full screen. If I have like a video or something that I want to watch, I just let it go full screen because it doesn't force both of my displays to go full screen, which is great. So it is displays have separate spaces. I knew I'd get there. So thanks for that, Peter. Good stuff. Are you, st do you do the displays have separate spaces thing, John, or are you still on the old way? Uh, Nope. It's off. It's off. Okay. I'm okay with that. I recommend trying it. I was okay with it for a long time, but I find it really is, it is a better way to live having, uh, having displays with the Let's really the, the, uh, requires logout. Yeah, well, don't, I'm not going to do don't that. Don't do now. it during the show. Yeah. It does require <laughs> logout. The only real downside is you can't have a window actively spanning both spaces, which is a, a rare thing. Anyway, I would only ever do it. Uh, really, I would only, it's funny, I would only ever use that to align my spaces. In fact, here's another quick tip, if, or align my screens. If you go, if you have two screens and you go into system preferences, displays, uh, there will be an arrangement tab because that's how that works. And arrangement will show you how the system perceives the relationship between where each of your screens is. And, and you can change that, right? You can move it up and down and then you can like move screens around. And the, the point of all that 
is so that when you drag from one screen to the other, it's seamless. It's like magic. Like it knows. And it, the reason it does know is because you've told it here. And so I would get a window across, you know, spanning both screens and, and adjust it that way. You can't do that anymore uh, with this new thing. But that, quite frankly, that's the only time I would ever want a window spanning two screens because it's, it doesn't really make sense to have it. In fact, I always would hate it when I would have a window that was going to the edge of the screen and then I would notice, oh, it's actually spilling over into the other one. I didn't like that. So anyway, lots of hmm. quick tips. Yeah. So, but it is nice to be able to go full screen on one screen and not on the others and have windowed uh, on the other screen. So that that's a huge benefit of turning that feature on, which is the default. So if you've, and it's been the default for like five or six years. So it, it's, or more, maybe more to be honest. So, yeah. All right. Any more on that before we move on to Craig? On to Craig. On to Craig. Craig says, sharing a quick tip that when I saw it documented was an aha moment. Some of us like to change our disc icons to customs, uh, custom icons, which is particularly helpful if you frequently connect or disconnect drives for moving files around, or hey, it's just cool looking. The process to put in place a custom drive icon is pretty easy once you've seen it done. It's basically just clicking get info on the drive, highlight the icon in the upper left, select the icon to use, via the finder view and it's done. I did this recently as a fun thing for an OWC drive enclosure used with my nightly carbon copy cloner backups. What is not intuitive is how to reset back to a default icon. I searched for about an hour, finally discovering a note on how to do this. Why it took me so long was a lack of specific documentation on exactly which system ICNS file contains all the defaults. You follow the same process of the change going to get info in the finder and selecting the icon in the upper left. And then at this point, you simply press the delete key. That's it. The default will be restored. The same technique can be used if you change folder icons, etc. You are right. Uh, he says, if you're not logged in as an admin privileged user, you may be prompted for admin credentials. So I, it, you are right. The delete key will do this. Obviously I do my custom icons a little bit differently. I do the same thing. I go finder, find whatever it is. I want to put a custom icon on and I do a get info. And then the, the icon in the upper left-hand corner is what I manipulate. But what I will do is I will copy an image to the clipboard first and then paste it into that icon in the upper left. And you just get it on the clipboard and then highlight the icon. You do command V and boom, it pastes it. And you can cut from there too. So that will take the icon out. So there you go. That's, uh, that, that's yeah. Custom icons. Pretty good. Thoughts on that, John. I heard you clicking around like a maniac. Nope. Okay. <clears throat> Just preparing for something. Preparing. Okay. <laughs> preparing is good. We had a, uh, a conversation a few episodes ago about spam and what, um, what systems we each use and ask you what systems you use for spam, because uh, I, I certainly don't have what I would consider a good spam workflow anymore. And, and to remind you all, my spam workflow is I let Google, so server side spam filtering via Google. And then I rarely look in um, my spam folder. The, the one thing that I do is I use a service called SaneBox. For a lot of different things. It auto files my mail. It reminds me of messages that I, I have not received follow up replies from people from like, it's great for those things. In fact, it is a service that I simply could not, would not want to live without. And I've joked, but I'm, but I'm serious about this. If Sanebox were to go out of business, my first order of business would be to create my own engine that does the parts of Sanebox that I need for me. It'd be a pain in the neck. I don't want to have to do that, but it's so valuable. Anyway, uh, one thing that SaneBox does is it keeps an eye on my spam folder. And if it sees something in there that it thinks is not spam, it puts it into a folder called Sane Not Spam. And so I do look at that, but that is basically the extent of my workflow. So uh, let's hear about your workflows. I'm not convinced any of us has a good one, by the way. Uh, Lewis says, I've been using SpamSiv for quite a long time, and its accuracy is very good at this point. Although you are right that it isn't 
server based. I run it on my desktop machine in my home office. Uh, the machine is on 24 seven, except for an automated reboot in the middle of the night. Mail is set to auto launch at startup. I have multiple mail accounts, my own domain mail, Gmail, Yahoo, etc. This setup allows all of my accounts to be filtered in one place. When I'm remote, all of my inboxes are updated via IMAP to reflect the contents of the home machine, which means it reflects the contents of SpamSiv. Of course, it helps that I've been using and training SpamSiv for so long that I can pretty much trust its behavior. I do check the contents of the spam folder regularly, but rarely find anything misfiled these days. So, Lewis, that that's the trust the system approach. Trust, but occasionally verify, I'll say. That's fine. I mean, I like that's honestly about as good as I've heard. Uh, it's it's that verification of the system that doesn't seem to be happening for most of us because it's such a it's spam is so high volume these days. So, yeah. Thoughts on that before I read through the rest of the or the next one here, John? Yeah, I got to <clears throat> find a better flow. Um, <laughs> we all do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I set something up the other day and I put it in spam and I don't understand why. Um, I set up a uh, reporting from my Synologies for, uh, you know, you can get a monthly uh, status of, you know, what's happening with your disks and all that. Sure. And I enabled it and I said, send a test email and I didn't get it. And I looked at my spam folder and it's in the spam folder. It's like, why are you putting stuff that's being sent to me? What put it <laughs> coming in the, from my Synology in the spam folder? What put it in the spam folder? Was it like Gmail or iCloud or something else? Uh, I think it may have been the mail junk filter. Oh, yeah. Cause it was, it was highlighted with the, yeah. If, from what I understand, yeah, if mail identifies something as spam, it'll uh, highlight it a uh, certain color. That, yeah. So I think mail did it. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And e that makes sense because it's an email from you to you. And so it, 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 you know, that seems like a strange thing. I can see why it, that would flag enough heuristics that it would be like, yeah, that might be spam. So mm. over it goes. I, I mean, you know. I, I think I've dealt with that before. I've been getting emails from my Synologies for a while and I've, I've trained things such that it's not as much of an issue, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, listener, John says I have PO box.com. Uh, I'm a legacy user, so I get it for free. He says, and that filters most stuff server side. It would be worth the money and it emails me every day. I check to make sure I don't need to release anything but their sending service also whitelists things that I've sent. Uh, oh, interesting. He says it really does limit my spam. Okay. So a server side solution with a slightly better uh, interface for managing this stuff. I can see that. Okay. So that's PO box.com. You know, um, we had mail route as a sponsor for a while here and we still use mail route from uh for our uh, our Mac Geek Cab mail. So anything you send to us goes through MailRoot. And that does a pretty good job of telling us what it has blocked. And it, it gives a nice little interface to manage the spam. So I guess for our Mac Geek Cab stuff, we are doing certainly doing better than our than our personal stuff. So that's good. Um, yeah. Interesting. I'd, I'd forgotten that. I mean, I, I check our MailRoot quarantine all the time. But, you know, you forget about these things when they when they become second nature, part of your routine, which is why I wanted to ask this question of us all. So, yeah. All right. So PO box.com mail All right. Yep. I, we're getting somewhere on this here. Thank you. Listener, John. It's good stuff. Any thoughts on that, John, before we move on? I think we got a couple others. Yeah. I like uh, the last, yeah. One, one I saw from mail route, I didn't even bother to read it because the title was opportunity. Opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh? Yep. Got it. Betcha that's spam. Yep. <laughs> Toss it. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the nice part. We can both manage that from their web interface. So yeah, it's good. All right. David, uh, David has a little bit more complexity to his. He says, I have a personal domain that I use for my private email that I have forwarded to my Apple mail account. However, there are emails I get sent to my Gmail and outlook just for historical purposes, uh, or, uh, or necessity. He says, here's where the gauntlet begins. I have my Gmail and my Outlook accounts forwarded to Apple Mail. This means these emails have to pass through the Microsoft and Gmail spam filtering rules before my rules, uh, the forwarding rules, are applied. 
So each email gets their own sieve before it gets into Apple's mail system and then goes through the Apple filter. If an email manages to get through all three of those filters, then I have a small set of rules to shift them into a subscriptions folder or things like that as I'm able. The Apple junk folder every once in a while has an email that gets mistakenly captured and I make the needed adjustments. But with this system in place about once a week, I can browse the topmost emails and see if anything got caught. If I go a few weeks and it's still a, it's still a quick browse to see the list and make the check. I didn't intend to set it up this way. It just happened over time because using just Gmail, I found I was doing this a lot more frequently and the same with just Outlook. So that's interesting. OK, so. So it sounds like he's got several filters in place, the waterfall effect, if you will, the waterfall waterfall workflow, but is only checking the last of them. So whatever Gmail and Outlook are catching, you're not checking and then only checking what Apple mail is catching. I mean, it, it's better than not checking anything, but of course the stuff that's caught by Gmail and Outlook, uh, you're never going to know. And maybe that's okay. I mean, you know, that's just, that's sort of what I'm doing here is if Gmail catches it, uh, unless I'm looking for it, I won't, I you know, just won't find it. And that I know that's not great, but that's just how it be at the moment. So I was hoping that one of you would have some magic workflow that like totally dealt with with this, but I don't um, No, Doesn't seem to happen. Thoughts on that before I got, well, I got one more John in the, uh, in the, in the listener queue here from go from this. Okay. Uh, so the last one is from listener, John, a different listener, John, who says, uh, I have PO box.com and I also, so this may be the same listener, John, or maybe not. Um, but he says, another thing that I do is I put my junk mail folder in the favorites bar. And by doing that, I see the number up there and that reminds me to go check it, which is interesting. I kind of like this. Uh, so yes, thank you. I, that's a good little tip of putting that there so that it's top of mind. Of course, it could be very distracting too, but having that up there, yeah, that makes sense. I like that. That's, that's good. I have also found, I think I mentioned this when we brought it up first, John, but when I'm going through my spam, which admittedly is not as often as I should be, uh, I sort by subject because so many spam messages have either the exact same subject or very similar <laughs> subjects. And I find it easier to, to go through, you know, multiples at a time because it's like what, what happens is all the ones that, that are the same sort of, you know, blur out from my field of view. But the human brain is very good at identifying anomalies. Right. And so these other things sort of become background noise. And then the ones that have like the, the lone subject line that is not common to other spam that sort of stands out to me. And it's like, Oh, okay. Now maybe somebody should write, this would be a utility, right? A utility for going through whatever winds up in your spam. So somebody could write a mail plugin to highlight spam that is, in some ways unique. So the opposite of a spam filter, right? So taking, instead of looking at all your email and deciding, okay, heuristically, these are likely to be spam. Now look at only those that are likely to be spam and look past them and say, okay, what, which one of the, which ones of these jump out at me as maybe being not like the others, and that might be the way to look at stuff because I don't need to see all the, you know, the 15 different ones for Viagra. Like, just get those out of my way. I want to see the 12 messages that don't have anything in common with the others. That would be really interesting. So maybe we should write, we should share this little segment with, uh, it's Michael Sy, right? That makes spam sieve. Is that right? Uh, I don't recall. I think used so. to run it. Yeah. I should run it again. Yeah. So maybe, maybe this would be a good, because, you know, SpamSiv, I used to use SpamSiv all the time, but then we went, you know, because we have phones and all these things, uh, I decided I wanted server-based spam filtering, not, you know, single machine-based spam filtering. And, and so that's the world that I live in and sounds like most of us live in, at least in some capacity. And so SpamSiv probably is selling less, but 
If spam sieve turned around and looked at it the other way, that would be a valuable thing for us because I'm only going to go through my spam on one machine. So it's fine if it's not running all the time. In fact, that wouldn't be necessarily, I mean, it could be, and it could move things. It could be like, like that sane, no spam thing that Sanebox does. So, uh, okay. All right. We have ideas. We will share them. So cool stuff. All right. We've got all kinds of questions and answers and things like that, but, uh, yeah, but that's the end of the uh, the spam stuff. And unless you've got anything else for that, John. Nope. Okay. I want to take a minute and talk about our first couple of sponsors here. And then we've got some security stuff to go through. We've got a lot to go through. So sound, sound good to you, John? Absolutely. All right. Our first sponsor here is Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. And this week, I get to talk about their new Envoy Pro FX, the fastest, most compatible, waterproof, and ultra-rugged drive available. So this is a portable SSD that works with past, present, and future Macs, of course, Windows, Linux, PCs, and the iPad Pro, the Chromebook, all Surface devices, with data speeds up to 2,800 megabytes per second. Super I, this thing's fantastic. Perfect for audio, video, your photography stuff, graphics, gaming, and really just general data storage, right? Because they've built this with trim support that works with Thunderbolt to deliver the fastest and most reliable portable drive performance available today. And it's certified as dustproof and dropproof and waterproof, and it's bus powered, which makes it smaller than most compact smartphones. Fanless. That's a good one, right? includes the Thunderbolt and USB cable so that it plugs into any machine anywhere and comes with OWC's three-year limited warranty and lifetime USB support. Very cool. Just started becoming available last month. 240 gigs all the way up to two terabytes starting at 169 bucks. Go check it out. The OWC Envoy Pro FX at MaxSales.com. And our thanks to OWC for sponsoring this episode. Next up is Linode, because you're going to need to use a server at some point, right? It might be for a little personal project. It might be for something you're doing at work, and it could be a new thing at work that then scales up. Well, that's the beauty of Linode, because they're server nerds over there. They know how to do all this stuff. You do your thing. You run your engine or you know WordPress or your VPN server or whatever it is you want to put on the server and then you let Linode worry about keeping the server running, having it on their super fast network, right? They've got the infrastructure. They've got the data centers. They've got the hardware. You know what you need to do with it. And that's where things are perfect. You know what's even better is that you can get started on Linode today with $100 in free credit just for being a Mac Geek Ab listener. And you can find all the details at linode.com slash MGG. You want to go check this out. Take advantage of your $100 in free credit. You've got 60 days to use it all up, which is great. You can really get a lot done in that 60 days and figure out how your whole system is going to work. Go check it out. If it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. Visit linode.com slash MGG and then click on the little create free account button to get started. And our thanks to Linode for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Uh, all right, Dave. We have the mystery of the disappearing file. Uh oh, this sounds like uh, it, it sounds like we got the right man on the job. What's up? What happened? Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so remember, we were. I don't know what happened. I I, I, yeah, I haven't found it yet. That's but fair. Um, Ben pointed out the fact. So so we were talking uh, about uh, time machine issues um, a while ago, and how someone was not having certain files backed up by time machine right. that matched a certain pattern. And I couldn't reproduce that, but I, the one suggestion was maybe your standard exclusions P list um, had that pattern in it or someone is trying to, you know, mess with you. Sure. Um, but Ben noticed this and sure enough, um, I looked on the system that I looked on to view this file was not my big Sur system, but my Catalina system. Oh, um, so this is apparently a known issue. Uh, you know, there, there, there was a post on uh, the Apple developer forum saying, where'd this file go? And there's no answer. 
this point. So I don't know why they got rid of it. Interesting. Huh? Yeah. I, I, and I've looked for it too. I don't seem to have it. So yeah, yeah, it, I'm guessing it's not gone, but I'm also guessing it might be buried inside a package somewhere maybe, or maybe it's frozen on the system partition so that it can't be messed with. Right. Mm -hmm. Now that we've got the, you know, the, the system and data partitions or volumes, sorry, not partitions. I'll get, I'll get it right. Eventually folks, there's this great show you can listen to called Mac geek. that will teach you all these mm -hmm. things. Um, and I'm going to start listening. I swear right away. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Okay. Huh. Interesting. All right. Well, hopefully, hopefully the, it's removal was, was a, a good thing. And in that it, like what you described couldn't happen that somebody can't intentionally or, or otherwise mess with that file. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, Patrick finds something interesting. He says, I was having Bluetooth issues with my M one Mac mini, uh, and I saw many people have complained about this. When my Mac went to sleep, my third party peripherals would lose connection and I couldn't log back in. I had to plug something into the USB port or use an Apple keyboard and mouse to get myself back in. The Big Sur 11.2 update fixed most of these issues. Now there is one more issue I'm having and I don't think it's exclusively an M1 issue. When I boot up my computer after it has been shut down or if I restart the computer, I am unable to use my third party keyboard and mouse. I've narrowed the issue down to File Vault versus Bluetooth. When macOS starts up, it only allows Apple Bluetooth devices to work, which of course includes the Apple keyboard and mouse. Only after I log in do my third party Bluetooth devices begin to work. Logitech used to recommend disabling File Vault, file vault which I think is not an option uh, or should not be an option in my opinion. On their support page, they now recommend using a USB receiver or a USB keyboard and mouse to log in. To test this out, I turned off File Vault and after all my third party Bluetooth devices and, and and after that, now all my third-party Bluetooth devices work. I understand Apple's doing this for security reasons, but I wish they gave us an option to put specific Bluetooth devices uh, on a whitelist or something like that. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, I, yeah, I so I wonder if something in the startup security utility would allow this to happen, right? Because you can choose to there's something in there about not there's nothing in there about starting uh, uh bluetooth keyboards and mice or third party things or anything like that but there is an external boot option and so disallow booting from external media is the default in startup security utility which you get to in recovery mode and then you can change that to allow booting from external media i highly recommend changing it to allow booting from external media because if something happens to your internal media and this is on, on its default, you, you know, you, you now have a much bigger problem to solve. But I wonder, John, if this external media, internal media switch is also maybe related to this particular issue. It's probably not, but it's worth checking. Go into startup security utility, turn on allow booting from external media, which, again, I, I understand the security concerns and you need to as well. But I, with that in mind, eyes wide open, I highly recommend allowing booting from external media. So, and I, and then there's the secure boot features, which uh, have full security, medium security, and no security about what types of operating systems are allowed to boot. And perhaps those are related. Like that's the only settings that I know of for this. So I'm wondering if messing with those would change it. I guess as a quick test, go to no security and allow booting from external media and see if your Logitech stuff lets you log in. That's all I got. What do you think, John? Hmm. I know. I am. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm, I'm set up with medium security and allow external booting. Okay. Um, because that's how I roll. So. Yeah. Yeah. So medium security is any signed OS, right? Like that's hmm. the, that's the deal. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. I like it. We'll put a link to this article um, about startup security utility in the show notes so that you can see how to get there and what it looks like when you do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, cool. All right. You want to take us All to right. Wolfgang, John? Yeah. 
Yes. Um, all right. Wolfgang says, thank you for giving, giving us all a good show. I'm a sporadic listener to your podcast and have learned many things. Good to hear. Um, my boot disk is full. Ooh. The computer does not boot, so I tried to use it as an external HD. Uh, so he must have put it in target disk mode. I tried to delete files, but I received the error message. The operation can't, com can't be completed because the disk is full. We tried terminal commands such as rm space dash r, but with the same results. Please advise as to what I could do. Um, one thing, all right, I didn't think of this with my initial reply, but you could put sudo before it. Sometimes you got to put sudo before a terminal command in order for it to, to uh, kick in and you'll be prompted for, for your password. So you could try that. The other thing is when I've gotten messages similar to that, sometimes you have to disable system integrity protection. And uh, we have an article that tells you how to do that on Apple's developer site. So um, that's all I got. No, I like the, the sudo thing makes sense um if, if these files are owned by root and you want to delete them you, you know you have to mm. you have to be able to do that some files on well anything on the system partition oh did it again anything on the system volume is uh read only right so you can't remove those but Chances are that's not bloating up and filling up your drive. I and mean, there's very few things that would even write to the system volume because it's read only like the system can't write there either, except for um, like one Tim standing told us like there is one sliver of time right before your Mac either shuts down or restarts after all other processes have been shut down. The system volume is quickly mounted as read, write, if there are any queued changes to happen to it, it they're written and then the volume's taken offline, reboot happens and it's re, it's mounted read only. So, but effectively, I don't think the system volume is your issue. So, yeah, I like your sudo thing and I like, uh, yeah, disabling SIP. I mean, there's some files that are prevented. I'm guessing that your um, the files that are causing this are just user files or log files. Obviously, it would be great to be able to boot it up and uh and and check one play but you can't and check with with a utility like daisy disk or or um clean my max space lens or omni disk sweeper right and any one of those can can mm -hmm. find big files but of course you're stuck um at single user mode on the terminal so yeah, i'm not sure that sudo would oh wait a minute i think i have an idea here john he says, my computer does not boot. I tried to use it as an external hard drive. Oh, okay. So you are mounting this on another Mac. Okay. I was going to say, if you were in single user mode, by default, the volumes are all mounted read only. So you would have to remount them from the terminal as read write in order to delete things. So it could be a permissions issue. And, and sudo, if you're, if you're just booting it as an external drive, that, that would do it. But um, but you could run space lens on it and 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 try from there. Uh, of course, uh, if you're if it's not letting you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, check to see how it's mounted. It's possible. Look in disk utility and make sure that it's not mounted read only or that it's check in the finder and make sure that it's not mounted with permissions enabled, disable permissions. And you might be able to to delete files. Yeah. But one place to check. I know I'm all over the place. Sorry. Uh, in, if you're doing it from the terminal, it's in uh, private slash var slash VM, I believe is where it is on most, uh, on, on all current operating systems. Somebody in the chat room at live.macgeekab.com will help me out if I, uh, but it, if I go to private, no, it's not in, maybe it's in private var. Is that what I said? Private var. That is, I just, I got to type what I think I'm typing here. And then there is a VM folder in there. That's where your virtual memory swap files are. Those can be large files. Like right now, I in private var VM, I have a sleep image file that's two gigs. It's normally at least one gig and, and can bloat up to two if you're doing a lot of stuff. And it can bloat up to a lot more than that. Those will be deleted at boot. But 
might not be deleted in time for your system to have any room to do anything with. So that might be a quick place to go get a couple gigs free and boot your Mac. So there you go. That's what I think. I don't know. Crazy. Any thoughts about my thoughts, John? No. Um, I mean, you could also clone that drive to a bigger drive. <laughs> Kick the can down the road squ squarely, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That'll do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, you want to take us to our last uh, last one here, to Stephen, John? Yes. All right. So Stephen noticed an article that we had posted that is uh, regarding uh, Apple has a, a page now where you can um, uh, modify the activation lock uh, feature of your, uh, of your uh, iDevice. Um, which is something you may want to do. Um, but uh, Stephen made an observation here, and he said, at first thought I had is this is now a perfect way to remote erase a target's phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so here are the pieces of data that you need. And then I did a little thought experiment here, actually a real experiment. Um, uh, so in order for you to modify this setting, you got to get in touch with Apple. Um, and you got to give them uh, certain information specific to the device. Um, and Stephen notes that an IEMI, which is like a hardware serial number, I guess, it's a unique value to any uh, 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 GMS-capable uh, device, I believe. Okay. Um, or GSM, yes. Um, and he's saying, well, the IEMI is not a closely held secret, nor is the device serial number, which is two pieces of data that they need to do mm. this thing. At least not enough for you to permanently erase my device via a website or call to Apple support. Sure, it requires your Apple ID, but I'm sorry, this should not be possible without physical possession of the device. I know why they did it. Locked phones are basically useless, but that's not enough reason to seriously weaken security by not requiring physical possession of the device. Um, a bit of social engineering and boom, your device is erased, um, along with all of your data. Um, so here's my observation on this, Dave. Um, I think it's harder for one to get the serial number and the IEMI than you think. Okay. So I went through an exercise to try to get these pieces of data. Um, so looking at my, my devices right now, um, my iPhone 12 mini, um, and I think most recent iPhones has absolutely no identifying information on it at all. I think older really? phones did. They would have like the serial number. They'd have the IMEI thing. right there on the... Uh on the phone really we don't have that anymore was it on the phone definitely yeah I, I i had a problem where i needed support for my phone and um hmm. and it, it like even the geniuses didn't know they're like well you got to get your imei i'm like well my phone's not working like how am i supposed to do that and they're like oh yeah sorry you have to call the carrier and i went out and it was like wait a minute there it is right on the bottom of the phone so but it you're right it doesn't uh, not on the 12 mini it's not there oh interesting right Okay. Um, oh, my iPad Air Four. It is does there. Have it. It is there. What? Pe Petter Hall in the uh, in the chat room <coughs> says it's there. It's in the SIM tray in your phone. So that's where it's Ooh. printed. It has to be printed somewhere on the phone. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to. Like, there's there's things you wouldn't be able to do. Yeah. So that that makes sense, Petter Hall. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, okay. I had not looked on the SIM tray. Yeah, I don't have a SIM the removal. SIM itself tool. has a number, but that's something else. Yeah, the SIM tray. Right. Thank you, Peter Hall. Ah, all right. I'll check that out. All right. Um, uh, to continue, the iPad Air four does have the serial number printed on it. Um, but getting the IEMI, Dave, I think is more difficult with uh, the latest uh, set, uh, uh, latest devices in OS. Okay. Um. Now, the thing is, you can, you can go to settings and then about, and that's where you find the IEMI. But here's the key, Dave, is that you have to provide either face ID or touch ID or the passcode in order to get to that point. So, yeah, but with it in the SIM tray, none of that matters, right? Like I, all I need is a SIM removal tool. If I have hands on the phone, I have the IMEI. No question about it. The serial number or the IEMI? Oh, sorry. 
the, just the IMEI. You're, I think that's right. Hopefully somebody that's listening can check. I'm looking around to see if I have a SIM removal tool within arm's reach, but I do not. So, um, so I can't, I can't personally. I don't that recall question. seeing the IEMI on, on the tray. Um, I'm going to look and see. Uh, I found a, a, a something that might eject this while we're doing the show here. So, yeah. I don't think it's going to. All right. So uh, to continue here. So. Um, uh, uh, so that. Um, all right. So so for to get most of this data, you need the passcode to be able to authenticate to the phone. Um, but I could be wrong on that. Maybe you can get all of it by looking at the device. Yeah. And the tray. Hopefully somebody will answer this right. question. Yeah. But let's assume, okay, so let's assume that you can. Then, so you, if you have the serial number and the IMEI, you don't need anything else? Is that enough? No. Um, okay. Another thing I did here, Dave, um, now you could run a utility like iMazing that also displays the information for the, uh, for the device. But um, that requires you also to authenticate with the device. And that's something that you shouldn't be able to do unless, again, you have the passcode. Um, right. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And now, and here's go ahead. Here's a physical hack I found though to get all of this data, Dave. You know where you can find all of this data? The box of the device. Oh, sure. <laughs> it's printed on the box. So hide your boxes. Whoa, that's right. Oh, so yeah. people can't get this data. Because so I was like, you know, I seem to recall that that information being on the box. So guard your box or or destroy it or something if you don't want someone to get these numbers from you right um all right so but even if you got those those dave you still would need the person's apple id and password to initiate this uh this this process okay okay got it um the thing is if you try to do that because i tried to do that so so that page has two things one it's like log in with your apple id so you can continue which of course you need the ID and the password, or you could try to change the password. But if you try to change the password, all your devices that are logged into iCloud will start screaming at you saying, hey, someone's trying to change your password, which should give you a heads up that somebody's trying to mess with you. Something's happening, right. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, <clears throat> this is interesting. I mean, this is, you know, we said for years on this show that there is, well, there are absolutes, but we all choose our place on the continuum between security and convenience or ultimate security and ultimate convenience. And this is yet another e example, I guess, of this topic where, you know, th it, th it has been difficult for users to be able to turn off activation lock on a phone that, uh, you, you know that like they that this has been a support issue for Apple. People wind up calling Apple all the time with this. So putting this in the hands of users makes it way more convenient for both the users and for Apple. However, it comes with you know a slight reduction in security, adding convenience. That's just how it works. Like that's that's, that's how it goes. So yeah. So um, Petter Hall again in the in the chat room again. Thank you. Uh, at live.macgeekup.com says that uh, you need a proof of purchase of the device somehow, either through your Apple ID where it's sort of automatic because it's part of your account or some other way of proving that you own this device. And then you can go ahead and, and flip off the app activation lock. So, okay. All right. That makes sense. I, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I don't see this as overly terrible, but I mean, I could, you know, there you go. Uh, yeah, Chiron says convenience is the enemy of security. And the 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 inverse of that is true. Security is the enemy of convenience. I You know, I love to say we could make our houses way more secure if we just had all brick walls. No windows, no doors, right? Nobody gets in, mm -hmm. nobody gets out. But that includes us. So that's, that, that kind of sucks. So let's not do that. Like, let's put a door in. Okay, well, now if I can get out, you could get in. And maybe I want to see out. So maybe let's put a window in, but mm, okay. Well now people can see in, even if they can't get in, that's a security breach, but now I can see out and mm. some sunlight can come in. Right. Like it's, right. It, it, it's just how it goes. We got to pick a point on the path. And I right. think, I, I think, which is why I'm glad we're having this conversation because I think it's important 
to it to pick that point with your eyes wide open. And it doesn't mean if your neighbor, you know, or me or John picks a different point than you that that you're wrong or we're wrong. It's that if you're doing it eyes wide open and you know why you're picking that point and what your risks and are and aren't, then you're good to go. Like that's it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. All right. Cool. Um Oh, and I found one other thing. Here's another way you can get the IMEI, Dave. Um, and you'll see that I uh, linked to an article uh, uh, that's part of Wikipedia. Apparently, there's GMUSSD codes. These are codes that you can type in directly into the keypad and have the phone do various useful okay. things. Okay, yeah, right, um, like, like forwarding star. calls and things like that. Okay, yep. Uh, I think so, but one of them, and I tried it and it works on the iPhone, is star pound zero six pound that will show you the imei and a few other numbers unique to the phone oh wow oh. yeah yeah check that table out it's pretty neat that's pretty cool that sucks i have a show to do right now otherwise i'd start playing with this <laughs> table so okay uh that's good though this is i like this this is great 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 okay i want to we have some more questions from you and 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 all sorts of things i want to take a minute and tell you about our next two sponsors if we're good with this discussion john yeah we are good all right next up here is sunbasket where at sunbasket.com slash m g g you get 35 dollars off your order for these delicious meals and they've really they've figured this out folks i uh, super efficient the way this works you've got their traditional meals which will give you uh, you know, all the ingredients and the instructions, it really is fun. Like following these instructions, it makes it easier to cook as a family. We've found, of course, it makes it easier to cook on your own too, but, but it certainly makes it interactive because you can look down the instructions and be like, Oh, you do that part. I do this part. And then it all comes together and boom, you've got a meal that you all prepared, you all cooked and you all can enjoy eating together. So it enhances the social aspect of all of that. That's their traditional meals. Then they've got their fresh and ready meals, which are just $8.99. So they're good for your body and your budget. And those are meals that are ready to go. You just heat them up and eat them, heat them and eat them. And they're delicious. And with things like Greek meatballs with tomato cucumber salad and lemon tahini dressing, lettuce wrapped turkey burgers with spicy cream carrot salad, Peruvian chicken over orange cauliflower rice with aji verde. I mean, how do you go wrong? Go check it out. Again, $35 off your order when you go right now to sunbasket.com slash MGG and enter promo code MGG at checkout. That's sunbasket.com slash MGG and enter promo code MGG at checkout for 35 bucks off your order. One more time, sunbasket.com slash MGG. Enter promo code MGG and our thanks to Sunbasket for sponsoring this episode. Next up is Ladder at ladderlife.com slash MGG. Listen, We've learned a lot about ourselves in the last year, and one of those things that we've learned is that life is fragile, right? Things can always change, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. And I know I don't want to leave my kids or my wife with a huge financial burden if something were to happen to me. And on that note, it makes sense why people get life insurance, especially term coverage, which is surprisingly affordable. Why not pay a little bit each month to protect the ones you love? And if you're asking yourself this question, choose Ladder because Ladder makes it impressively fast and easy to get covered. It just takes a few minutes and you just need your phone or your laptop to apply. Ladder's smart algorithms work in real time so you'll find out instantly if you're approved. There's no hidden fees. You can cancel at any time. And since life insurance costs more as you age, today is the time to cross it off your list. So check out Ladder today to see if you're instantly approved. Go to ladderlife.com slash MGG. That's L-A-D-D-E-R-L-I-F-E dot com slash MGG. Ladderlife.com slash MGG. And our thanks to Ladder for sponsoring this episode. I think it's time to talk photos, John. And listener Darren has a question for us. He says, uh, backups are important, aren't they? My backup drive for my 42,000 photos has failed, but all is not lost as they are still, of course, in my iCloud photo library available to me on my phone and my M1 Air. Both are set up with optimized storage as there isn't enough room on either device to keep full res originals. How can I create a backup of my photos? 
I know I can move the library to an external drive, then keep the originals, but I want the libraries on my internal drive. Ideally, I want an automated way to back up retaining live photos, etc. Okay, so to my knowledge, and please correct me if I'm wrong, there really isn't a way to automate backing up to an external drive unless you store the full library on an external drive like you mentioned. But I have a few options. The what would I do if I were in your shoes scenario? And the first thing I do is ask on Mac Geekab. So again, if I miss something here or if we miss something, because maybe John will catch me too, um, let us know. So the first one would be to set your main user account to your internal drive optimized storage. So exactly as you have it. Then create a second user account, which uses the external drive for full storage. You can have two user accounts on the same Mac that are logged into the same iCloud account for photos. And so only the, the, the cool part is that it will only pull down photos to your external drive when you're logged in to this secondary account. So you can take your laptop with you. You've got your optimized access to all your photos as you would like. And then maybe once a week, you set your computer down as you go to sleep or something, log it into the other account and let it slurp down all those photos. Uh, so that's one way. And then number two is log into iCloud.com slash photos and download from there. Now it will only let you download a thousand at a time this way. So you would have to do this 42,000 times. Uh, sorry, not 42,000 times. You'd have to do this 42 times. So not, not great, but not terrible. Certainly not as bad as doing it 42,000 times. So there you go. Um, but that would be the other way. I don't, I don't know of any, like it would seem to me that it might be possible for someone to write an app that, logs into iCloud on your behalf and slurps down your photos and saves them somewhere in this automated way that, that Darren is, is suggesting. I don't know. Um, I don't know that it exists, but it might like John, what do you think? Any, any thoughts on this? No, I'm with the, you know, download in small batches is <clears throat> yeah. probably your best bet. Yeah. But I, I don't know. It seems like this could be automated. So anyway, hopefully, let us know. Feedback at MacGeekUp.com. I know, it's extra, but it's worth it. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, John, you want to take us to Todd? All right, Todd has one that uh, <clears throat> uh, caused me to do a little, little investigation because I haven't done this in a real long time. Um, and he says, under people in my Photos app, uh, he didn't say which, if it was iOS or Mac OS, but, but it has... It's on both uh, in different places, obviously. Um, sure. There's a bunch of photos attributed to my full name under people and a bunch attributed to just my first name. See attached. And sure enough, he had that. Um, is there a way to bulk reassign or teach photos to get all of me under one name? Uh, also in the attached one has a black bar behind my name and the other does not. What does that represent? I think it might be the ones with the black bar associated with my contact card. And the other one is just called my first name. Um, took a little fiddling, but I figured it out, Dave. Um, in photos on iOS, click on the photo in people. Their name will be at the top. The name attributed to that photo will be at the top of the screen. Click on that and you can change it. Um, and then photos on Mac OS, it's a little different in that you click on the name under the photo in people, and then you can also edit it. Can you do this in bulk? So, I think you can, right? I think you can I, highlight multiple photos and say, make all of these this other person. Uh, I did not try that. So maybe I, he can. I think you it. can. I, I have memories of doing this and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's relatively, I think it's exactly that you, you highlight them and, and do it. Now, the thing is though, if photos is convinced that you're two separate people, maybe you, you know, send that to the IRS and, and they might, you know, mm -hmm. send you a second stimulus check. So, you know, maybe this mm -hmm. could pay off. I don't know. Um, I don't encourage uh, this kind of thing, but you know, that's how it goes. No, no, no. <laughs> um, as far as the black bar, I don't know. I found mm -hmm. various discussions about it. Some people say, oh, it's still indexing your photos. But when I looked at mine, there was one that, uh, and I haven't done this 
you know, IDing people for ages. And I only had one photo um, that had a black bar on it. Uh, some suggest that it was to help center the photo so it looks pretty. Um, I don't know. So I don't know what the black bar uh, under um, people is for. If you know, let us know. Yeah. Feedback let us know. at com. That's it. That's the one. I've emailed that address before. <laughs> Those guys answer. It's amazing. I've heard mm. they answer every question that comes in. It's, it's an unsubstantiated mm. rumor, but, you know, I've heard that. Mm. So it's good. All right. Moving on to Paul. Paul says... I'm using macOS Big Sur uh, and have the latest version. And I used my uh, I used to have my photos set to open in Graphic Converter if I double clicked uh, on a photo in the Finder. Today, when I did that, it opened in Preview. It was a JPEG for what it's worth. So I made certain that it was still highlighted and then pressed Command I. According to the file information, it was set to open in Photoshop. Getting stranger. I clicked the drop down and chose graphic converter and then clicked change all. This is done in the finders get info box folks, just uh, which is great. If you want your, all your JPEGs to open in a certain app, you find one of them. You do exactly what he said here. You go file, get info in the finder. You, there is an open with section, choose that. And then make sure you use change all so that it changes everything. Uh, he says, I didn't notice that it's asked if I wanted to change all and uh, to open with the application Google Chrome. Uh, he says, I didn't notice at first that it wasn't saying graphic converter, and I click continue. The dropdown immediately changed back to Photoshop. And when I double-click the file again, it opened in preview. Okay, curiouser and curiouser. So this was his, his question to us. And then before we could answer, uh, he wrote us back. He said the first, he says, I, it, well, he did say he was going to try uh, to clear some caches with Cocktail, uh, the the Mac app to, to do this stuff. And then he wrote back. He says, so the first thing I saw in Cocktail was launch services, which I figured sounded like a good candidate. I rebuilt it and rebooted. When it came up, I checked the info on a JPEG file and it showed to open with Google Chrome, which was a good sign because at least it was taking the instruction that I had given it, albeit incorrectly. Uh, he says, so I changed it to graphic converter, click change all, click continue, and it stayed. I double clicked that file and voila, it opened in graphic converter. So yeah, this is, is, this is interesting. And it sounds like your launch services database um, was corrupted and needed to be reset. And so in short, you had an LSD problem. There, there, is a, mm. uh, <laughs> there is a process called LSD on the Mac that runs full time. And that is the launch services daemon or daemon, if we're going to fight about it, uh, which according to Apple provides support for launching apps and matching document types to apps. So this is definitely where your issue was. And it, and, and you're totally right. Like the, it, I don't know what made you choose launch services as the first, th first thing to reset in cocktail, but you definitely hit the nail on the head that that is the answer here and can be really helpful in solving these weird problems. I, I, I've seen, I don't know what causes launch services to get wonky like this, but you know, it's a big database of stuff that's constantly being written to. So it doesn't take much to, to corrupt it, it seems. So, but yes, Cocktail, Onyx will all let you reset LSD, as it were, uh, in, your, mm -hmm. uh, in your Mac. So, yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Yeah, I've had where sometimes if you say, if you click on open with, you'll see multiple instances of the same app. That's another sign that launch services needs to be fixed. Right. Right. Excellent. Yeah. yeah I yeah. haven't had that happen in a while, but, but I've seen reports of it in the past. Yep. Um, one final thing, if you want to uh, get down and dirty and look at the, the innards of uh, how uh, the, your Mac figures out what to open when you click on something, there's something called Swift default apps. Right. That may have been another way to kind of uh, to uh, solve uh, uh, this type of problem, that's a, another thing. It basically allows you to see what extensions and, and various things are mapped to what applications. Right. Right. So. That, I, I, I always love it when you bring up Swift default apps because that is the uh, Swift version. So written in the language Swift 
of what I think was probably your first, if not one of your first contributions to what we now call cool stuff found on the show, which was RC default app, mm. right? Early, early, early on. So yeah, handy utility being able to dig into that stuff. Now I just wish we had res edit, John, not that we have resource forks, but I just liked res. Yeah. Res edit was fun. If you don't know, well, the kids, you can ask your parents what res edit was. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. I'm sure there's some like Wikipedia article or, or something about what res edit was for the Mac. The Mac files used to be in two, um, two forks. There was the data fork and the resource fork. And it was actually kind of cool because the resource fork had what we now call like metadata for the files. So, Things like the icon and uh, other bits of, mm -hmm. of information, including like what kind of file it was, that sort of thing. And uh, it was Apple's way of solving this before, I don't know, before we do what we're currently doing. So uh, so the, um, the this app called ResEdit, which was from Apple, uh, allowed you to manipulate that. So you could change your icons and things like that in there, which was fun. So, yeah. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know where we're going with that. Uh, Keith has a question. He says, and it might be a geek challenge. He says, I've been trying to find some tools to use with Mac OS mail. And I wonder if you have any suggestions. I have a couple of things running that send email alerts. I filter these off into folders and try to remember to check them every day. I generally don't delete them straight away, but I have sessions every few months where I blitz all the old messages. Is there any utility you're aware of which can automatically delete mail from within specified folders after a set period of time? So anything older than, say, 100 days gets deleted. Okay. Um, I don't know that I know the answer to this um, because I have a few, few folders like this that I'd like to solve as well. And so, so now, John, I'm thinking about, all right, what would I do? to solve it. And my first thought is a rule in mail or even on the mail server, if you can, uh, but Apple's rules only apply to incoming messages. So that's not going to trigger any rules. You could create a smart folder that shows the contents of another folder, but only things in that folder that are older than four weeks and unread or, or read or something. Right. So, you know, and then you could create an Apple script to delete the messages in that folder that gets a little convoluted, but it might work. I feel like there's an easy solution to this, Joe. I, I it, Joe, I don't know why I said Joe Keith. Um, I, I like mail steward. It mail steward is an app that I feel like I need to start using. I've got, um, over a, I I've saved pretty much every email I've ever sent or received. Now, obviously some marketing emails, I, I jettison, uh, but, but it, by and large, I've saved everything. And so I have my mail folder is like 112 gigs or 125 gigs now, which is like, it, it's, that's not sustainable to, to like put that on every, um, or, I mean, I only have it on one machine. It's the machine in the office, but I don't know. <coughs> I'm, I'm feeling like I probably should be using mail steward. I, I have this thing about, do I want to trust my data inside a third party app that might you know, not be around for me to get my data. Like, so I, I, and I know mail steward uses open database formats and stuff. So it's not, that's not really an issue, but you know, so anyway, maybe I should start using mail steward. If you use it, let us know. Or if you use something else, let us know. I, I, I feel like there's, there's an answer here for Keith and, and for, for Dave. So I don't know. What do you do for any of this stuff, John? Do you, do you just um, mound it all up on one of your machines? Uh, I do a couple of things. So one thing is that in Apple's mail app, if you go to accounts, mailbox behavior, um, you can identify a trash mailbox and then it will erase those after a certain time period that you can select. So that could be one hmm. workflow that uh, you may want to get into. Uh, and all of mine I have set up, you know, th th throw out the trash once a month. <laughs> yeah. But these aren't trash after yet, month. right? Like these are just, in, no, I understand. You that. know what I mean? Like, yeah, but, but you're right. Like this auto remove things in that folder, which we have designated as trash once a month. I mean that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. The other thing that I do on occasion, I haven't done it for a while, but I don't want like you, I don't want any one mailbox to get too large. 
So typically I will take things, um, you know, like for example, my Mac observer, uh, email, uh, I only keep a year's worth of stuff in there and the rest of it I put in an archive mailbox. That's a good idea. My thought, I, yeah. My thought being that the less it, it'll make mail more responsive if um if there are fewer items in any one mailbox. And I think that's kind of the purpose of archiving anyways is, you know, put it off but you you may need it you know at some point in the future then yep. in your archive mailbox. Yeah, I I do the exactly the same thing. I have annual archive folders for both sent and received mm -hmm. mail. And, uh, and I go and, and, and those are stored, you know, in the, on my Mac section. So they are only on one of my Macs and it's, you know, that's the one where the big archive is. And then the rest are just whatever is in the IMAP mailbox. But, uh, but that keeps it, you know, keeps things sane. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's a, there's it's, it's mail imperfections or imperfections in dealing with large amounts of mail, including spam seems to be a theme for this episode here. All right, let's, uh, where are we here? We got time for a few more things. Um, let's go to Sandy here. Let's, we'll, we'll see how we can get through a couple of these here. So Sandy says, uh, I'm realize I'm a little late with converting to big Sur. No, no, John and I each have a machine that, that, is not on Big Sur yet. You're fine, but I've just done it uh, and it's working pretty well so far. However, I found a new problem this morning concerning backups. Usually I have time machine backup to a partition on my Drobo, which saved me during the installation of Big Sur. And I also make a bootable backup to an external drive with Super Duper. That backup failed last night. And in reading Super Duper's website, it has to do with Big Sur and the way it uses drives. They have a workaround that I could try, but I wanted your opinion on the matter. Should I wait for them to get the problem solved and then start making backups again? Does Carbon Copy Cloner work with Big Sur? And should I simply move over to them? I really just need something that works and is easy to run. One other question. Do I have to back up with Time Machine to an APFS drive? My Drobo doesn't support those, but I've had no trouble with it so far. So to answer your last question first, nope. You can do HFS plus or APFS. There are some benefits that we're finding about using APFS for time machine backups, especially, well, actually both on direct attached, but it'll new backups over the network, new, back, new over the network backups created with Big Sur 11.1 and later will create APFS disk sparse bundles um, and new backups created to uh, APFS drives on, on, you know, direct attached drives will take advantage of some of the, um, Oh, why can't I think of it now? The, 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 uh, what's the thing that big Sur does the snapshotting or yeah. APFS does right. So to make your backups more efficient and that, and that sort of thing, which is great, but no, you don't have to HFS plus is still totally supported. So you're good there. Um, over the years, you know, Super Duper and Carbon Copy Cloner have kind of leapfrogged one another. One of them will add a feature, do a thing or solve a problem. And and then the other one catches up and they, you know, kind of that, that's just how it's worked over the years. At the moment, Carbon Copy Cloner is ahead of where Super Duper is with uh, this particular stuff, especially with Big Sur and bootable volumes and all that stuff. Um, I'm guessing that, you know, Dave Nanian, who so Dave makes super duper Mike Bombick makes uh carbon copy cloner. And I'm guessing that Dave is on this. Clearly he's aware of this based on the posts that he put in his blog about it and we'll get to it. Uh, but it's not easy stuff to solve and you want to make sure you get it right because if people are using your software to back up, you want them to be able to trust it. And so it not only is just figuring out the solution, but also testing it like crazy before you have your customers use it. So you might reach out to Dave and see if he's got a test version that you may or may not be comfortable using uh, or switching to carbon copy cloner will solve this particular problem. You might wind up in a leapfrog position down the road, but Hey, if you've got licenses for both, you know, then you can just flip flop back and forth. at will. So, yeah, that's, those are my thoughts on it, John. Anything? You got any, you got any more others? No, I'm good with the uh, good with carbon copy cloner. Same. These days. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Michael has a geek challenge. He says between my wife and I, we have two Apple watches, two USB C iPads, an iPhone 12, an iPhone 10 S and a 2012 MacBook pro 
and a 2018 MacBook Pro. Is there anything we can get that will charge everything at once? If not everything, how about just the iOS devices? I'm looking to get organized in 2021. So you are looking for one device to charge them all. Um, I, you know, we've talked that that Satechi thing that we talked about uh, in a recent episode. I'll, I'll pull it up and put it in the show notes again where it was, you know, you put things in like file folder sort of deal. It was part of cool stuff found uh, and plug the cables in. That sounds like maybe what you're looking for here. I mean, we suffer from this problem, too. Our, you know, our bedside tables and our living room, like the edges of the couch between between the couches and the end tables are a rat's nest of very specifically selected cables and power and all of that stuff so that we can charge our devices when and where we want to be. Uh, it's but it's not like it's not great. I get you. <laughs> so, yeah. Let us know, folks, if you've got something for him. But I'll put that 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 Satechi thing in the in the show notes for you, Michael, and we'll uh, we'll see where we go from there. So, unless right. you have any thoughts, the, um, the Apple Watch is just chi, right? The Apple Watch is chi. Something happened to your sound. I don't know what happened, but maybe you turned off a compressor or something like that, John. But you got quieter. No. Okay. Interesting. It happened between when you muted to cough and not cough. And I don't think it happened on my end. So we can still hear right. you. It's fine. But it's mm -hmm. it's something's different for sure. So. But um, but yeah, the, the watch is is chi only, right? We kind of sort of chi. It's 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 chi with its very specific puck, basically. OK, OK. But the, but there's no cable that plugs into the Apple Watch to charge it. Is correct. That correct. That's correct. Okay, I didn't. I didn't think yeah, that. yeah. No, you're right. Yes, it it is right. It's it's chi ish only. Yep, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting to find one charger to roll them all. Like, yeah. Yeah. When I when I updated my machines, I actually got um uh it it it's a little heavy, but but I it charged. It's an anchor one i think it's 95 watts and it has two usb a and two usb c um, okay so it can charge four things at once which is, is you know a step in the right direction yeah for sure yeah 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 yep all right um i am going to where are we here we are so close I, we're gonna do one more here and it, it's a handy little one from jose uh so that we're not having to deal with John's audio level will, um, if we had more questions left, we would, we would do this. But anyway, Jose says, uh, I purchased an iPhone for my wife. When she makes phone calls, my name appears to people as her caller ID. I had heard this could happen when phones are purchased from the Apple store app, uh, which I did since somehow these devices get associated with the purchaser's information. Is there a way to correct this issue? So you are correct that devices get associated with a purchaser, but that's a different problem than what I think you're seeing. Because what I think you're seeing is coming from your carrier because it's the carrier that sets the caller ID. Uh, and that's usually tied to the account holder's name unless you change it. Uh, and there is a way to change it with each of certainly each of the major carriers and pretty much every carrier. You might have to call support uh, with any one of these, but it is doable. And we have links for AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile and Sprint that we will put in the show notes. And sure enough, um, it it was uh, it was T-Mobile that he had and and, you know, just go into the link and they, they've got instructions for how to do it. Most of these allow you to do it online and. Uh, and so that's that's where you do it. So, yeah, it's good stuff. Good, good stuff. Um, it's time to bring the band in, John, I think. Yeah, I th thought, huh, I'll have to look. I, I, I know I came across it on my phone somewhere where I could set it on my phone. I could change my uh, caller ID. Name. Oh, really? I thought it was in, was it in really? the phone section. Huh. Yeah, let's see. Phone? My number. Yeah, I don't know that I've seen that on my phone. I'm on Mint now. 
And I don't, I don't know that I get to set that. Not here, but I can go, you know, I don't know if I, I looked, I think Mint, you have to contact customer service to do it. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't see it. I don't see it. Yeah. Carrier services. No. I know you can go into like settings phone and set your phone number, which is sort of mm -hmm. weird to me that you can edit that. I don't know where that matters, but, um, but yeah, I, there is a show my caller ID in my phone settings, but it, it's just a toggle for on or off. It doesn't let me say what my caller ID should say. So, yeah. All right. All right. Good, good. Uh, thanks for listening, folks. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for everything. We love getting together with you every week. It's it's part of what uh, it's part of what we get to do. And uh, I do want to take a minute here, John. I know we're uh, we're running on time here, but I do want to take a minute and thank all of our premium subscribers whose subscriptions uh, have renewed or who have contributed in the last month. Uh, actually, last couple of weeks. It's been a couple of weeks. I don't think it's been quite a month. Uh, but uh, I want to thank, and, and you can learn about this at MacGeekUp.com slash premium. Really, it's not mandatory that you do this, of course. Uh, if you like to and you have the means to, it definitely is a part of our support structure here and, and how we keep the, the show rolling. Uh, so I'd love to thank George from Surrey. Or George from Lightwater, right? Which isn't sorry. Yep. Okay. Ken from Kailua. Chris from Chorleywood. Racer from, I'm not sure where. Michael from Robbins. Mark from Panama City. Matthew from Fork River. Tony from somewhere. David from High Wycombe. Dave from Saugerties. Michael from an undisclosed location. Jeff from Chesterston. Bill from Duxbury. James from Melville. Joseph from Marietta. Michael from Rochester. Brett from Pembroke Pines. Frank from Tunbridge, Michael from Concord, Scott from Calabasas, Robert from Columbiana, Stephen from Plainfield, Mark from New Fairfield, where I used to live, Ralph from Attleboro, Barry from, well, who knows where Barry is right now, Dionisio from Oakland, Tim from Bright, William from Hebron, Joseph from Shorewood, Dan from Parts Unknown, James from Chester, Clifton from New Hall, Stephen from Costa Mesa, Everett from Marina, Olga from Bellevue, Jason from Charleston, Larry from Alpharetta, David from Seabrook, Paul from Fishers, Mark from Milford, Gary from Babylon, Neil from West Hartford, Lou from Albuquerque, Joshua from a very secret place, Louis Michel from St. Laurent, Randall from Portland, Peter from Sudbury, Abel from Santa Rosa, Peter from Auburn, Bob Dr. Mac, working smarter for Mac users, Levitis from Austin, hope things are going well down there, and as for James in San Antonio as well, Abdullah from Reisterstown, Margaret from Waukegan, Robert from Hamilton, Jeff from North Belmore, Ari from Kensington, Nick from Mount Clemens, Elliot from Brookline, Harvey from Washington, Timothy from West Windsor, Bob from Lepeche, Harry from Durham, where I currently live, Michael from Milwaukee, David from Farmington Hills, Brian from Danbury, Thomas from Sacramento, Santiago from Palm City, Dimitri from Moscow, Drew from Santiago, Richard did I say from San Diego? I said San Diego. Not sure why I said that. Richard from Galesville. And thank you very much, everybody. That's the end of the list. There we go. Thanks so much for your support. You folks rock. Uh, it, like I said, we, we couldn't do this without all of you, but it, you can support the show. Really, the best thing you can do is what you've already done. You've listened. Interact. Send us stuff. Tell a friend about the show. This is how we do it here, and we really appreciate it. John, do you have anything else to add before we uh, before we get out of here? Thank you, everyone. There you go. Thanks, everyone, indeed. Oh, we will uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for visiting our sponsors. MacGeekUp.com slash sponsors is where you can go. Of course, the sponsors we mentioned in this episode. LadderLife.com slash MGG. SunBasket.com slash MGG. Linode.com slash MGG. And MaxSales.com. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week. You rock. John, you got us into this, but you've got to get us out. What's the magic? Oh, man. I will get us out with 
these three simple words. Don't get caught. Made up. And we're out. What happened to your game?